doing well. How about yourself? Uh, doing well. I love your background. Where are you? <laughs> are you like over Sirius or some other planet? Or <laughs> well, I I figured you know with a uh, title like VP of Innovation, I needed something you know very like you know out there in the universe and. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your organization, and what you're passionate about? Love to hear. All right. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a chemist by degree, and I've, um, I, I started out in, um, in the world of waste, which is kind of interesting for a chemist and hazardous waste. And found isn't that, isn't that a good place for chemists to be in the world of waste? Uh, it, and actually, it, it's better for me. It was better than being stuck in a lab. So, files and right? yes. So out and about, but uh, yeah, that it just kind of expanded into environmental health and safety and and a, a different uh, you know um, industries, pharmaceutical, um, manufacturing, like automotive, especially chemical manufacturing, and then. Um, and then, you know, around, gosh, a dozen years ago, I switched to the technology side, which is really funny because when I, I came over to technology, had no idea what SAS was, had no idea what a relational database was, you know. Oh, SAS was relatively new, so I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it, uh, I, you know, I didn't know like a lot about tech, which is really um, quite interesting that now I'm just, I, I love it, right? And, um, and, and though I, you know, I've, I've been passionate about making sure that, that people, that businesses um, understand how to use technology in the right way, um, how to adopt it, what, you know, and making sure that it's bringing value. And it's like, I don't care what tech you adopt, just ad adopt technology, understand what it can do, adopt it and implement it in a way that can improve your programs. That's what I'm really like passionate about. So I have been working um, in the industry of, of software um, with environmental health and safety, sustainability um, for, you know, for a few years. And then here at Verdantix, um, I'm the VP of innovation, which means I cross over all the different practices. So Verdantix is an independent research firm that focuses in on technology, focused in on smart buildings, um, ESG and sustainability, um, EHS, operational excellence. So really how you, you know, thinking that the technology that will help, you know, we hear the word you know, digital transformation. Um, I'm frankly, <laughs> you know, that's everybody's <laughs> buzzword, right? There, there we go again. <laughs> exactly. There we go again. And, and so um, really, you know, how, how, what technology is out there and um, kind of educating, doing research, how, how does that affect the typical pain points that people um, are, are focusing on? And it's such an interesting time um, now where I think, People were adapting technology fast and fast before this world that we live in, you know, of a year now. Um, and then that slowing down helped people think about it more rationally and take a step back and say, wait a second, we're not going to implement tech for tech's sake. Let's think about, right? So it gave us one thing, gave us time to take a breath and kind of really look at what we have and what we need um, in our digital strategy to achieve success, which is in this day and age, that means more, right? Stay, staying afloat, staying in business, staying, you know, profitable, no matter what industry that you're in. Um, and then on the other side, it gave all of these smart guys, developers and thinkers to come up with new and exciting things. Like I am just overwhelmed um, in the past just six weeks of how much cool stuff is out there. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Oh yeah, it's phenomenal. Well, it's just you. It's interesting you should use the term digital transformation because it means many different things to many different people. By the way, do you use the DX short form like CX DX? No, or... no I'm not. <laughs> no, because I really, I, I think, and I think most CTOs right are tired of that word too, right? And two technology officers, they're just like, oh god, please do not come at me. But it's like all the salespeople use it, right? So I'm like, oh. Like I'm kind of, you know, it's, it's the better word bingo again. It's like, oh man, now, you know, take a shot. <laughs> well, what's your, well, what's your definition of digital transformation then? What, what, do, you, what do you define it as? Uh, to me, it's right. Um, looking at your, your internal processes, it's taking technology, right? 
and it's applying it in a way that improves, right, your programs, your operational efficiencies to drive better outcomes, right? So it's, it's not, you know, a lot of people, you know, implement things because it's cool and they think it's cool and like, we're going to do this. And then, or they think about it, right, the whole people process and technology, um, they just think that it will be the, you know, technology is the magic button. But to me, it's right, you really look at, I'm going to adopt some type of technology and, and the reason I'm adopting it is to make sure that I'm achieving and helping achieve our corporate objectives. Yeah, see, I think a lot of people think of it as taking a current process or whatever they're doing today and digitizing it when it's really yeah. the other way oh, around. Yeah. And forming first and That's then right. applying the digital to the transformation. And it, it to, to and it's kind of like, but they're they're just looking at what what they're currently doing and doing That's what correct. you're currently doing is not it's not really digital transformation because you're not really transforming you're just like that's, right. that's digitization right but still I think people conflate those two things together because it's so easy to just say let's just apply technology to what we're doing now and of course that's not that's not the right thing to do oh so many people right and then they they're they're again going to that you know fifty percent of IT project fails that's one of them right you you implement technology and you just do the same thing, right? That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing just yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. expecting different results, right? So I'm taking an inspection that I used to do on a, you know, piece of paper, right? My pencil, check, 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 and instead of, right, and, and file it into um, a filing cabinet. And so what, um, you know, people do to your point is they'll take that and say, okay, now you're gonna just do it on an app, check, 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 and it just gets stored. Right. And yes, it, but you don't do anything with that. Like, okay, well, what happens? How do you analyzing that information? What is that process? Who needs to improve it? Who cares about this? What if something's wrong? How do you, right? They're not, to your yeah. point. Or do, you, not do you even need a form at all? Do you even need this? Pro does this process, is this process worthwhile? Period. I mean, they, right. just sometimes they've been doing these things for so long. They don't even, it's like the old TPS report from Office Space, right? Do we still need the P TPS report? No, we don't, but people still do it because it's something to do, right? You, you have no idea how many times I'm sitting with, you know, customers and, and we're, you know, looking at the system. They're like, oh, I have to have this field. I have to have this field. And if I ask, well, wait a second. Why do you need that field? Oh, we have to capture this. I'm like, okay, what do you do with that information in that field? Why are you capturing it? What report does it rely to? What, what KPI does it help you achieve? What... And they're like, no, we just collect it. And I'm like, then we've always you? collected it. So we're going to keep on collecting it. <laughs> we don't remember why. And we don't do anything with it, but we're still going to do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Becomes a very necessary field <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> well, that's interesting. The statistics you gave, that, that statistic, the 50% of IT projects fail. Why do you think that is? I mean, what, what do you, you think is the big reason behind that? That's a huge number. It's a huge number and, and there's lots of different reasons, right? So, so one, you know, that we've talked about, which is the fact that people just take their current process and they just do the same thing um, uh, and expect a different outcome, right? And they don't get any different outcomes and they're like, well, then what, you know, we're just going to go back to the old way because why do the process? Um, some of it is along the fact of they try to, um, I call it adopt the technology where they to, to drive the process, right? So they overcomplicate the system, right? To drive the process instead of having the technology to support the process. In other words, they lock it down so much. There's one customer a couple of years ago, an Australian like mining company, and they're like, okay, so this person can't see this. And then once you have to lock the record and do that. And I'm like, okay, yes, the technology can do it, but you're, creating yourself a nightmare of, uh, you know, you know, adoption, but, oh, but people won't do it if you don't do that. And I'm like, okay, then you need to invest in change management, which is another reason why IT projects fail. Oh, you don't you, the biggest. <laughs> you don't invest in that change management, right? You don't, you know, as part of the process all along the way, right, before you do the project, right, get in the stakeholders and you have to include that, you know, um, the naysayers and the people who are excited to adopt, right? You have to have that cross. You have to 
you have to at least make them feel like their voice is heard and, and part of that process and bring them along and, and show them and again and then kind of evangelize and and and, and kind of support that. People think that once you go live, oh, it's going to run by itself. It, it doesn't because you have never, to get That never happens. I don't know. I, I've doesn't. never seen it ever, ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> it, it never happens. And that's what, you know, and again, if you don't invest in that training, they don't think about that. What do we do that training and support to get people in that user adoption, right? Uh, one of the things that people always say about technology, what's one of your key components? Well, every time we send out our survey, annual survey for, for Dantex, it doesn't matter which practice that it is, the top thing of what technology has to have is a great user interface. I'm like, what's the definition of a great user interface? Because to some people, it's the cool widgets, right? Like the cool things. To me, it's minimal clicks. Personally, it's minimal clicks. Like I don't want to click 8 million times to get someplace, right? But so to me, it's get me where I need to go, two clicks, right? So I'd always talk with, work with project managers and project and product design and say, nope, too complicated. Get me there in two clicks. Right. That was yeah, like it has to be it has to be totally <laughs> simple and intuitive. And I think you're right. I think my, one of the things I, I think is a real tenant of human nature that people forget about a lot is laziness. Right. People want stuff to be just done very, very quickly. And they don't really want to do a lot of put a lot of effort into it. And I think a lot of companies are like, uh, you know, well, the customer is going to do this, this, this and this and this. And the customer's like, I don't want to do that. I just want it to be done. I just want it to happen. And employees are the same thing. They just they just want it to happen. You know, anytime you you add a process or change a process, it's the same old thing. Right. I mean, people people want less process, less steps, fewer way, fewer, you know, steps in the way or two, fewer tasks to be able to complete because everyone's busy enough as it is. Well, why would they want to do any more? Right. Right. And, and that's, you know, one of the biggest things like, oh, you're just going to overcomplicate my life. It's going to be more complicated. Right. And then you have, I, um, I call them the, uh, the unicorns, right? The people who think that they are so different, right? Yes, there's 8 million other companies like us, but we're so different. Let me tell you why. We oh, yeah. are so unique, right? And so they're so unique that they want an off the shelf product, right? That's another thing people misinterpret what off the shelf is. Um, so they want an off-the-shelf product that has standardized best practices, which are out there. But they're like, oh, we can't possibly do this. We got to change it because we're so special, right? So again, then what you're doing is you're complicating a system that's put out standard to help you get data out. And, and they forget, they lose track of that, you know, um, element of it's about getting data out that you can get meaningful insights um, um, and so when you overcomplicate, because they think they're special, it costs a whole lot of money um, to implement it because you got to do all these configurations. Then you have to worry about each time there's a release, no matter whether you're SaaS now or whatever, and it just comes, bugs, right? And then again, that user adoption, like all of that maintaining of a system. So lots of different reasons, but those are some of the key ones why those projects fail. Oh yeah, well, I find I find that change management is really the biggest piece because if you think about it, the technology can be configured all sorts of different ways, right? I mean, whether you have a SaaS product at one end or you have a totally custom built piece of software at the other end, you know, the technology can be anywhere in the middle, but it's the human being who's got to agree with it and go, "This is this is what I want" or "This is what I don't want," right? So. I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle of a project right now where we're implementing this, this massive system and senior management is like, well, you know, we don't really care about senior, we don't really care about change management. They're going to get this system and they're going to love it because here are all the great results that they're going to get out of it. But then when they actually go, went into play, they didn't realize that sort of like the interface would cause so much more effort at one end that, you know, and they didn't even bother trying to get the, the, the people who would be using the system acclimatized to it to understand this is how much more work would it be. Yes, there's be all these positives, but there's so much more work on the other end. And there's this, there's this kind of battle brewing now with, between senior management saying, well, you're going to take it and you're going to like it and you don't really, and we don't really care what you think to, you know, we're fighting back against you because we don't like, we don't like the way the system is operating right now. I mean, how do you deal with those kind of competing interests? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, before you get there, some of the things that I always say is, when you have that, um, and I know in, in the industry that I come from, um, you know, EHS and sustainability professionals, not always very technical, 
right, sometimes and not always the best at how to communicate and translate the value to the other stakeholders, which sometimes management does as well, right? So they're just like, yeah, this is the better for the company, but they don't actually translate it, right? So they don't say, you know, I always talk about, hey, if you're trying to do this, so management saying, oh, you're, it's going to be better for you. We'll explain to them how it's going to be better for you. And to say, yeah, I know it seems a little bit complicated, but it, to your point, right, it's having that, that communication up front before it's launched, right, along the process, hey, this is coming, right, here are the things, let's give you a preview for it um, and, and have that communication so people kind of know that it's come in. The other thing that I have found really interesting that a lot of um, uh, services and consulting firms are doing ar around this to, to change this is right when you're doing UAT, right, so user acceptance testing, is to just give a, the use cases to somebody, right, the target audience, give them the use case, don't teach them anything about the system and see how they interact. Because And they'll watch, right? They'll videotape it and they'll watch it. It's almost like design thinking. They're like working with the prototype. They're thinking about the prototype and then you're actually getting the customers to be involved in the process, right? And once the customers are involved in the process or the employees are involved in the process, then they feel more bought into it and they're more likely to use it later on, right? Yep, that's exactly right. And, and lo and behold, that's only been started like 18 months ago is when I've started seeing this. And it's like, where's this been <laughs> all of our life? Because that's because that's key because everybody is different, right? And of course, depending on, you, you have to think about the different, um, uh, you know, kind of, you, you know, makeup of, you know, age differences, right? Between who's gonna be using this because, you know, um, and, and that's kind of difficult too, right? I'm an oldie, so I'm used to clicks and things like that. Like I have still yet to figure out Snapchat. I, I don't get it. Like <laughs> my daughters have either. like, I have no, I, I don't, I don't get it whatsoever. <laughs> Daughters are trying to explain, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. So I'm taking a picture to tell somebody instead of talking to them or, or texting them. Like, I, I don't know. But yeah, but that's what they're used to, that instantaneous, right? And you still have to marry that with the fact of you've got older, you know, us more mature people, I should say, not older, more mature people. And so how do you find that happy medium of that, you know, user interface to, to adopt. And again, you know, it's, it's people forget to show why it, it, that feedback of why it, it's um, valuable, right? So, um, you know, it's going to be better in the long run. How is it going to be better for me in the long run, right? So if they explain to them the pain, yes, it's a little bit difficult on this, but how much time did it take for you to run that report, right? Like, oh God, that report was like awful. I had to take it from this data and this data and this data and this, this system. And then I had to do this and I had to check down this. Go, okay, now you're just going to do this and then you're going to push a button. And they're like, oh, well, that's interesting, right? Yeah. So. It's interesting. The, the Actually, there's a bit of a dichotomy here because I think that this goes both ways. I had this whole uh, conversation with somebody like, I, I was of the impression, like I was saying earlier, that people are lazy and they'd like less, they like stuff to be done for them, right? I mean, wouldn't, what, wouldn't, who wouldn't want like a personal assistant to do stuff for them, right? And I was talking to somebody younger and they were going, oh, no, no, I don't want that. I, I want, I want to do everything myself. And I'm like, really? I thought people were, were, were <laughs> yeah, easy <laughs> button, snap. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and then, so you really, what is, what it, what it begs the question is like, do you need completely different interfaces? Do you need like a super simple interface where everything's done for them? And then do you also need like a super complicated or a, a, a more complex interface? So if I want to dig in deeper into the details, I can actually do that. I mean, is that, is that where things seem to be going? It's, it's there, right? Most companies have both, right? They have the simple, you know, ATM easy interface and they have the more complicated interface. And, um, and, and, and they've already adopting that, right? And then of course, then you add the mobile aspect of it. And then that kind of gives you that easy interf interface too. But when you have a mobile that's connected in with a broader platform, then you kind of get the best of both worlds. Right, so then you have the mobile app has got limitations. So you can't do everything right. you want on a mobile. But it all, it's almost easier to use to, to use mobile because you do have to have it limited to those specific tasks that you can do on mobile. Uh, but that's an interesting point because now people want mobile and and aren't like realizing there are some things that should not be done in a mobile app. People want to say, "Oh, yeah, I'm going to use mobile for everything." Well, mobile's not meant for every 
everything. Yeah, you can't, if you, you can't have, have complex nice interfaces, key. yeah, you can't do that. And and that you know that's another hindrance with technology because you know then you have people go, oh yeah, just do, put it all in an app. Well, not everything fits in an app. Well, you you were saying something interesting earlier about best practices. Like a lot of companies are looking for best practices because that's one of the reasons why they buy SaaS software because they figure, oh, this, the SaaS providers already figured out the best practice to do X. And they're just going to buy into the best practice. But then the moment they get it, they go, oh, my God, this is not exactly what we want. So we customize it like crazy. So you've you've practically taken this SaaS software and it's not off the shelf anymore. It's practically custom a customized piece of software because they had to make, make so many changes to it. And, and, it, and it's kind of like, where do best practices fit in? Do they really want best practices if they want to try and customize this thing like crazy? Um, I, I think they do, right? Because best practices uh, have been proven. Like it, you have, you know, a standard process out there. And I always think about it as um, taking an event management. And I call it event management because it's really un any unplanned item that happens, right? So if you say incident, people think health and safety, but I, like any unplanned. So you had an IT security breach, you had um, you know, somebody come in through a, a security, you know, breach through your physical part, whatever it is, you had a spill and release, whatever it is, there was an unplanned activity, customer complaint, unplanned activity, right? There's a standard process. You capture what happened, no matter, like, again, it doesn't matter. You capture what happened, you investigate what happened using different methodologies. There's different methodologies that you use and you can use different ones depending on the type of thing that happened. And then based off, you gather witness statements, you have to do a report and based off of what you've learned, you do corrective actions. That is it like, the same for everybody. It's it works the same, the same for, everybody. for everybody and nobody can, like, I can't even tell you how many, oh no, 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 that's not how it works for us. How do you, like, what's so different report investigate, crew costs, like what? Like process improvement, ensure, especially if you're ISO driven, no matter which ISO program or standard you, you follow, it's that, you know, plan, do, check, act. It doesn't matter. So it's kind of like, again, but yeah, everybody thinks that they report incidents differently. Yes, I understand that who can report is completely different, but you're still reporting and then, you know, you're capturing what happened. Capture what happened. How do you yeah, do that? You have to use the same process all the, like every time, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you you know, get differences of data. You know, you won't, you're not sure what you're going to get out of it. So it, it really should be like a specific process that works every time. I had Nirvana about five years ago. I was working on a project with a global pharmaceutical firm. Um, they had seven different divisions. And they M and A activity kind of breeds some of this unicorn capability in different processes. Seven different divisions. They all report to different people, um, and they all reported incidents differently. But they were going with a enterprise solution to report incidents, and we got them to all agree on one standard process. What seven different? Groups? Seven wow. different business units that operated Fantastic. individually underneath the umbrella. You're a miracle and worker. <laughs> it, it well, it, it was because we had the right team working together. You had the right people at the company driving it. They brought in the right stakeholders. You had somebody who could make like decisions that would disseminate out to the different things. They had edicts. They had clear objectives. They had right a technology partner and implementation partner that collaborated together. And the results that they got, like within three months, was amazing. Like it was un unheard of. Like lots of accolades for for the team. They got recognized internally as a great IT project. They got so much information to put new programs together and focus in on some of the things, their risks that they could improve. That it was, like I said, it, it's the only time it's ever happened, but it was amazing. Nice, nice. So let's talk a little bit about the 50% of the projects that don't fail. Do you see any like particular, particular like aspects that that they have that work really well? I mean, like what what are the elements of a project that won't fail? Uh, first, you have to have clear right objectives, right? Um, you have to have a clear defined scope and commitment not to scope creep. That's another one we didn't uh -huh. talk about. Good luck. Is, is, is <laughs> scope creep, um, which is always leads to that. But yeah, clear to find, like, you know, 
line in the sand, here, here is our scope. We're gonna stick to this. Here are our clear objectives, right? And then you have to have in the makeup, I just kind of talked about one, right? Within the makeup of that internal right group, you have to make sure that you're doing a cross-functional kind of steering committee and the people in there are empowered, right? To make decisions and be the voice for who they represent. But you also have to tie that to their overall um, objectives, their own objectives for their compensation, right? So everybody has goals and objectives and it has to be, they have to be allocated to that, right? So 10% on this, the project that was really, I just talked about Nirvana, they had to dedicate 15% of their time and that counted toward their evaluation, right? So Ooh. just like, yeah, they yeah get, exactly. They actually get real skin in the game. They because have to have so many times when you're, when you're project game. managing, you're basically like herding cats, right? That's I mean, right. because these people are like, if they're like, they, oh, I have no skin in the game. I'm still getting paid whether I work really well with this project or whether I yep. don't talk to them I'm at all. I'm busy. But, I got you many things to do. Well, when you yeah. tie it, yeah, tie it, it to their- Very smart. Yeah. And, and it works, right? So you have, and, and they picked people, they picked the, the loudest dissenters, right? To be part of it, to include them, make them feel <laughs> part of it. And they always, you know what? The biggest, the loudest people who are objectors, when you bring them onto the project in the right way, they usually nine times out of 10 become your biggest cheerleaders on the backside. Because, yeah, because they feel heard, right? They feel like they, they, like they feel heard and it. they've been, right? They, they've been evangelized, right? They, they've, they've drunk the Kool-Aid and they see what it can do, right? And so then they're like, oh, th that's power, right? Talk about that change management. When you have somebody that's known to be a dissenter, to be all of a sudden, wow, this must be something because that person is, you know, gung-ho about And then you this. bring, you, as long as you bring them in and you give them a voice at the table, then sometimes that just quiets them up because they just, they just want to be there and then they'll get sort of like an inside view into the project. So they know that they, while they're dissenting on this thing, they'll eventually turn around because they'll go, well, do we really want to move this thing forward? You know, unless they're really, really bad, in right. which case it still works though. It still moves people. <laughs> it, it does. Um, and, and that's key, right? So you have to have, you, um, and, and that is when you put together the project team, then you have to find the right technology partner. Um, no technology is perfect. I've, I've worked for a couple. No technology is perfect. No technology is bug free. But you have to be with someone. I always talk about it. it it's, it's like a marriage, right? You're going to have a relationship with this person or, you know, with this company for a very long time. You want somebody that, you know, even in the bad times, you can still have a decent conversation with and it's not gonna be ugly, right? So like, um, yeah. so, so that's, you know, finding the right technology partner, um, having, you know, when you have the business, you ha also have to have within your company business, the business uh, um, represented as well as IT. Because typically, right, sometimes you don't have, IT is separate and you don't have a business analyst that kind of is in between those two. Um, you definitely have to have them in the room. And it's always, if you don't have that internally, then get kind of a consulting partner who can play that translator internally to your business and IT. That's that's pretty key. So as the innovation person with your organization, are you charged with bringing innovative products out to market? Or like, what is your... What is your remit within your organization? Yeah, what I am in charge of doing is looking at all this great tech and kind of saying, how, how can this apply to the, the problems and, and the pain points in these different industries? What tech is out there that can help solve it? And, and how do we look, not looking at it insular, right? Because now as we're, technology is, you know, bringing all these departments that never used to talk to each other closer together. And these there's drivers that continues to make people come together and share information and, and share data. So it's looking at things, um, you know, uh, in the pandemic, right? Smart buildings and EHS, smart and healthy buildings, right? How is technology that maybe was used historically from an EHS perspective can be used now for air quality emissions in, in office buildings? Right, so it's kind of taking that and saying, okay, here's all this great new tech going on. How do we? How, how does this apply across? How does it apply to different pain points and use cases? And it's been so much fun, like really some really fascinating um, tech out there. 
Well, how um, smart are these buildings that you're creating? I mean, I would love to have a building that would know when I'm walking in. It would know when to turn on the lights, to turn off the lights. They, to they heat, do. Not they, heat there's over. technology it, now. Really that they smart? Do yeah, that. I, I, yes. don't want it, you know, I don't want me having to say, Alexa, do this. Alexa, do that. You no, know, no, I want no. To it's, that exactly. it's crazy. I just um, – just looked at I it was I was just like oh my god that's so cool um I, I I'm a, it's so funny of someone who's just ha, was never like a tech geek but I've like I now just fascinated um, I have friends who are tech geeks but uh, fascinated so I just watched um, a, a demonstration from a technology firm last week right where uh, they were using it from um, from a process safety perspective, but they applied it then to the office building. So you walk into the office building, and, and we all like you have the key cards and, and swipe and things like that. So you walk up, and there's a sc it, biometric scanner. You walk to the scanner; it recognizes you don't have to touch anything. It recognizes you, takes your temperature right? Opens, slides, you know, it's either like this way or it opens up that way, right? Lets you in the building, automatically has told the elevator which door, you know, to open and take you to your floor, right? And you have, it knows which, you know, access areas you have access to and not access to. It's actually where you are, like gives you hints of like, um, it will send you, uh, you know, the, the notifications on your phone of, you know, hey, there's, you know, someone cleaning the bathroom right now for the next five minutes. So, you, like, yeah, so there's things where you're not touching anything can it, anymore. Can it bring it me is. coffee yet? Can it bring me coffee yet? I wanted to bring coffee. <laughs> that would be really fantastic. <laughs> check my caffeine level. Oh, my caffeine <laughs> level is too low. Caffeine level is <laughs> low and uh, I, I need a, or, you know, with developers, you know, the caffeine and sugar level is is low. And so you need you to gotta keep those, they got to keep those caffeine and sugar levels really high. <laughs> I know that's the great developers are all the same. They're fantastic. I love them. You just that you make best friends. So if anybody out there wants to make best friends, with a developer caffeine and sugar, like, like candy, like it's like, Oh yeah. Do you remember Jolt Cola? Whatever happened yes. to Jolt Cola? It was like twice the caffeine, right? <laughs> all the sugar. Twice well, they the have caffeine. those now, right? There's like, Coke energy and there's all of these like crazy like even worse than Red Bull and now like I'm eating that like, Coke oh. Coke and coffee together like in a can and I'm like Ugh, I don't know how that how that would taste I don't know if I'd like that <laughs> two different concepts <laughs> but you're doubling your that. caffeine Coffee's right <laughs> for the morning Coke is for the afternoon but anyway <laughs> so, oh but the it can't get me coffee yet then it's not it's coming though at some point i, I think yeah at some point right i always joke you know looking in the future we're gonna be um the, the surrogates right the bruce willis movie where everybody's like stuck in their and their homes and the in the safety of their homes and their surrogate is out like in the world and being shot and it doesn't matter because it's just wow. a <laughs> it's almost like it's almost like today <laughs> We're stuck in our home. People who can go out and we can and we can see safely through our surrogate. So, well, yeah, that's going to happen one day. We're we're, we're just going to be sitting at home in our couches, you know, with our AR or VR headsets on, and we'll have our surrogates walking around. You know, I was like, oh, I want to travel to Paris, so let's let's just like beam ourselves into a surrogate in Paris or something like that, and then we'll experience the whole thing. Well, you, well we're speaking of that, there. one of my colleagues is obsessed with the new the goggles right the ar goggles where you can you know all of us are remote now right so we're remote but we could put on the goggles and it could seem like you're sitting right next to me like you're in a virtual room together and whiteboard okay, and I've things heard that, i've heard that those new the new oculus the, the yes, oculus two it. or something like that yes. they're supposed to be really good and they're only about 300 bucks plus they're wireless so i'm like oh yeah, yeah sign me up for that so that was, yeah, and we we looked at, uh, we were doing research on that. And so the team um, in North America, because we're so dispersed that from our London team, we all put in, because we was budgeting um, season, because our fiscal year. So we all put in, we're like, hey, we, we since we still can't get together, we want the Oculus 2 goggles. And it's exactly. only 1200 bucks. 
<laughs> exactly. Think of it this way. I mean, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of like commuting money and all sorts of other money, like, you know, uh, office space money. There's probably plenty of money like slushing around now that was allocated to, uh, to servicing employees in offices. So why not just take that money and, you know, spread it out? And let them, but let it's them do true personally. though. It's and it's fascinating though because there is some great applications to that. You know, thinking about how you can improve processes with that. You know, being able to see things right that you weren't able to see. You would just take a phone call and have to envision. Now you could actually say, "Okay, show me what you're talking about," and I can walk you through it. I mean, that that's pretty fascinating how that's um, being applied. And of course, um, with the AR technology and the digital twins as well. So kind of you know running through scenarios, kind of testing it, um, you know, without, you know, it's the new crash test dummy, right? Doing a digital yeah. twin. Well, seeing the AR situation where, I mean, I could just walk through, walking through my life and I have this, these AR goggles and they're like telling me things as I'm, as I'm walking through the world, you know, like go to this restaurant, don't go to this restaurant. Hey, or it'll, it'll automatically recognize somebody who's walking down the street. This is somebody I know, but I don't no, remember yes. his name, so it'll like pop up. <laughs> Or this That's what happens person when it, starts going. You're like, I'm hoping technology can fill in the blanks, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it can, right? And who, who to avoid? And don't forget, right? You know, walk down the street. Don't forget you, you, you know, your anniversary is coming up. But it's everybody's going to have part of that. Retail is going to have huge implications. It already is, right? As you're going through stores, and now it'll tell you, oh, you know, and, and it uses machine learning to say based off of your. Um, you know, your habits of your buying habits and stuff. So it knows the things that you like. So it is getting to that point of saying, hey, right, it's been six weeks since you bought razor blades. And you're like, oh, yeah, oh, my gosh, you're right, right? So it's like helpful um, to help. Yeah, it's much so, more yeah, efficient than, than just signing up for one of those subscription services and then stuff just piles up when you don't use it, right? It's like you want the sensors to be able to say, oh, I need more milk or, oh, I need more razor blades or, or I need more this. Like if there's sensors in the home, talk about smart buildings again. If the smart buildings know when these things need to be replenished, then they can automatically order and restock, right? We don't really need people to yep. look at that stuff or or, or have too yeah, much and of it, it, subscriptions. Those things are happening now, right? I use, I've got one of the... Um, because my daughter loves tech and we have one of the refrigerators and it's fantastic that you can, like I'm at the at grocery store and I'm like, ah, oh, do I need eggs? Do I need butter? Right. And I can go on my app and look inside my refrigerator and Whoa. see. You actually yeah. have one of those? I I've do. Of those. That's cool. It is cool. Oh, like, yeah. It, and, you know, it plays music. Bixby's my pal. Um, Cause you can talk to Bixby while you're in the kitchen and it's, but yeah, but that's very useful. Feet? Do I have do I have enough eggs? Do I have enough? <laughs> you can't do that yet, right? Well, I mean, there's speech to text. So as long as you know they're all adopting, right? So speech to text is getting much better, um, which is great for a, a lot of people who have learning disabilities and things like that. You know, the speech to text or people who are like too busy or you know like to drive and you know, not text, but you can do speech to text. But yeah, speech to text and that, all the element that drives kind of like the, I'm not going to say the G word because right next to me, he'll say what, because I've got, you know, <laughs> but if you have one of those, you know, the voice command, they're all being able to where you could say, you know, between the S on my wrist and the G over here on my, on my desk, you know, They'll pick up on those things, and, and all of the technology is being able to to pick up um, and through APIs and and take that data in. So yeah, more and more you're going to be able to talk to them. I mean, you can talk to you, um, you know, here in the states with Xfinity, you can talk to your remote. I don't have to flip through the channel. I'll just like you know talk to it, and it knows where to take me. All of that is being adopted into technology so quickly. Um, that yeah, you won't have to, nobody will have to read or write. They're not even like teaching cursive anymore because it's not going to exist. It doesn't need I know. to. I have to be, I'm <laughs> actually been practicing my cursive, but it sucks. So <laughs> it's no good. <laughs> but I say, so what I want, the problem is that virtual assistants are great. And, you know, I have one, you, you have one, a lot of us have them, especially the techies, right? But the problem is that they're not proactive enough. I mean, they should, they know so much about me. They should be able to understand whether when I woke, wake, walk into my office at 5 a.m., I don't have to tell it to wake up. I can, it'll just wake up because it can sense that I'm Say walking. Good morning. In. Yeah, when are we so going to get to the point where they're proactive? 
Well, that's when, you know, that's where machine learning comes in and where a lot of people don't understand um, machine learning and what it is. And uh, I've done a lot of education on that as, as I've tried to like teach people because think, talk about the easy button, right? So you've got in that, that flip of gender. So the mature people who don't understand technology and say, okay, well, it should just tell me what I need to know, right? All this data is going in. It should just tell me where my problems are. Like, yeah, it doesn't actually work that way, right? So, um, which is funny, that shortcut that the, the more mature people want. Um, so, uh, but it, it has to, it, it's all about the data that's coming in, the quality of the data that's coming in, right? So the more that you feed it, and I always talk about this, and everybody's like, what do you mean by data quality? And it actually reminded me of, of another reason why things don't go right with it. Um, and this goes into machine learning is what I call the, the Coke problem because soft drinks, right? Like are like the, they're soft drinks. It's soda, depending on where you are in the world, it's soda, it's pop, it's, you know, it, it's yeah, beverage. Those East coast, West coast, it's soda and pop, right? It's very you know, different. I, I grew up in the Southeast. I don't like, I've lived all over the world and in Switzerland, I, it's always a Coke, right? I'm from the Southeast. It's <laughs> like, it's a Coke. Um, and so uh, and so that, that happens ac across, right, different, like different terminologies through M&A activity, right? It's the same thing, but people call it different. And, and that translation of those things doesn't necessarily happen. And that's where your data quality comes into play, right? Or how the data gets in, right? Um, so just think about like titles, like VP comma innovation or VP space innovation. I'm going to be entered in two different ways right? Because I, m that title is different in databases. So there's two of me somewhere because of that, yeah. that, that data inefficiency. Even a concept of a VP of innovation is different from company A to company B, right? Yeah. Especially right. innovation, because it could be anything. It can be anything. <laughs> right. Machine learning is, it's a, it's a tough thing. It's a hard, it's really a hard problem. And I think a lot of people think that we should be further along than when we are, where we are right now. Well, it, but they have to think about there's so much data is animatized. Um, the data quality is terrible. And that's what I talk like people, they're like, oh, we, you know, we want to, to use, you know, um, uh, analytics, right? Advanced analytics uh, and, and true, you know, like machine learning, like, you know, um, th there's different companies out there that make sense of that data, right? And it's great, but I'm like, okay, but you have problems already with those best practices and consistencies in your process yeah. that like right and like and you know I'm like how how good is just your regular business intelligence reporting how accurate is that how accurate is this data you know that you have you know have problems with people putting the data in in the correct way right so let me tell you right like the more that data quality goes down the effectiveness of what it's going to predict or what it's going to tell you, right? You go to predict it to prescriptive, which is what you're saying is tell me something that I don't know. That prescriptive, I might as well, do I have, I have well, I have a dime here, but I might as well do a coin toss, right? Because the accuracy yeah. of that is like, oh, it's going to be red or black. Well, it's going to be black, you know? Um, and that's that's because the data quality is so bad. Machines can only learn so much. So it learns from the volume and the quality of that information. And until we kind of standardize, which is never going to happen. I mean, look at our units of measure. <laughs> like Europe's on, every, all everybody else in the world's on metrics. And, and the U.S. is still on, you know, gallons and pints. And But we want to um, challenge our technology to figure it out for us. It should be enough. able to do that, right? <laughs> It should be able, that's correct. It should know how to convert. I ask the G over here all the time. Hey, like if I don't have time to like, hey, you know, calculate this for me, convert, you know, Fahrenheit to Celsius for me, because again, I'm in the Fahrenheit world. I used to be in the Celsius. A lot of my friends are still in the Celsius world. And I'm like, oh yeah, I have to, and I don't just don't have the brain power to do the, you know, nine fifths, five ninths plus or minus 32, right? So I just ask my virtual Yeah, that's assistant. too complicated for me. I know, I just asked the virtual assistant. That's what it's great for. And then I lose that whole capability of being able to calculate it, but it's okay because it doesn't matter. <laughs> awesome. So so let's say, let's let's do our, our four. So it's uh, 2031, 2031. Where, where is the world going to be in 2031? Where, how are things going to be in 2031? Um, I think 
Um, and I and then this has changed a little bit over the past year because I thought we were totally going to quit the human interaction, that everything was going to be technical interactions that nobody would have to. That was my whole theory on the um, the increasing number of autism in the world. My, my daughter is autistic and I always look at those numbers. It's like, oh, because they need to be prepared for this world that can process everything and our neurotypical brains can't do it. So that's evolution, right? Um, so it's changed a little bit. Um, I, I do think we're, you know, technology is going to to drive our days, right? Um, be more and more like like the Jetsons. Um, but, you know, the, the human element, I think people have realized that they missed that human contact. So, you know, 2031, I think, you know, um, it's all electric, you know, um, cars and, and vehicles. We I, I can't see us having flying cars, so sorry, Jetson fans. I don't. I don't oh, see come us flying cars. <laughs> There's less things up there to hit. <laughs> but it's yeah. That, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> we never know. Um, yeah, definitely. Could you imagine like the the high? It would be crazy up there. High, uh, skyways instead of highways. Well, I've seen. Um, but, I, saw, I saw a. Um, I saw a flying car back in 2015 at CES. It was basically like a giant drone, right? It was a yeah. it was a human sized drone that you could fit a human into. And of course, since then, I haven't seen anything anywhere. So, yeah, yeah. I think you're well, right. I think we're pretty far out. I, I think that's far out, but I, I do think it's not going to be electrical. Then everybody's going to worry. I mean, batteries are going to be huge, right? There's going to be a huge. Um, that's an interesting one to me about how you um, how you address that because I, I I do believe we're going to go electric, but I still think about you know. My dad, you know, when we did family trips of like, you had to like hold it like, you know, eight, 10 hours of time on a car trip because you're just wasting time when you stop and you no, know, like, how are you going to have batteries and, and that, that technology to go that flat long, right? Without stopping yeah. and charging. Well, that is something that we need to work on. We do need to improve our battery power. But I, I'm a big fan of alternative things outside of batteries because I mean, look, if you look at something like, uh, what is it that the Mirai, the latest one, it's, it uses some other type of fuel. So fuel cell technology. I yes. think there's other technologies yep. that we probably should be exploring, but we seem to be like- oh, I do, I, I think care. there's- there, there are, there are alternative, you know, I think, um, you know, the hydrocarbon, I think they're seeing a lot of replacement for that. I think that's interesting instead of like natural gas. Um, but yeah, I, I think we're going to see more going back to, to um, uh, natural food processing um, as well as we, you know, come back to that. And, and so kind of conserving our, our world. So I think we're going to see less processed food, I think. Um, yeah. and more, more natural food and, um, yeah, and more electronics and technology kind of, um, yeah, kind of, kind of, you know, supporting our day from the time you wake up, you know, good morning and raising the blinds and, you know, knowing what your habits are, understanding, unlike your, you know, dog and kids when it's Saturday and Sunday and not, <laughs> not a work day, right? And, <laughs> And the holiday. Yeah, I want, I want something that know. will remind me. Well, it's like it's got a. I think technology right now we spend too much time fighting it. I think it, we need to have it. It needs to help us more, right? If there's certain goals that we want to reach in life, we should be able to use the technology to to get to those goals, yeah. and the technology should help us get to those goals. And we're well, not and quite we, there we yet. See, well, well, we see that in different elements, right? So you know, um, think about the the pelotons, right? That's technology helping people get to a goal and achieving a goal, and it's telling you, right? Hey, here, follow this, like, and it out, you know, outreaches to you and reminds you to do it, and it, it, it like, you know, positive reinforcement, all those things that we need. Um, so we're getting there in different areas. I think it just needs to be more widely adopted. Sorry, there's a problem with my mics. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh. My background changed. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Hello? Hello? Are you there? Oh my gosh, I think I lost you. Let me just check my... Hello? 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 Yep, we're back. Can you... We're back. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not sure what I happened. I saw you. I could hear you. You went into technology. We, we went to technology is just awesome, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it knew we wanted to go to a cabin instead of an yeah. office. <laughs> I love Zoom. Anyway, so it's great speaking with you. This is fantastic. Um, so if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Uh, yeah, you can always uh, go to verdantix.com or uh, pbobbit at verdantix.com. And yeah, look at all the technology and information that's, that's going cool. on. It's, it's well, put your contact information in the show notes. And if anybody wants to get in touch with you, they'll, they'll do it that way. So thanks so much. It was great talking with you. Thanks. Same here. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you.